Michael Jackson. Elvis Presley has been dead for 20 plus years, but he still has followers. Over the summer, you know, um, Barbara and I, we were in Vegas, it was my very first time, and I'm amazed at how popular Michael Jackson still is. You, you, you have individuals there that they kind of play his role and, you know, they have these big shows and long lines of people are waiting to just see a Michael Jackson look-alike or a Barry White look-alike. And people are crying for autographs. But I believe that is in the nature of some of us, or all of us, this insatiable desire to want to follow. LeBron James, Steph Curry, somebody say amen right there. <laughs> we just have this passion to want to follow. Movie stars in the Christian realm, some of the great preachers of our day, the T.D. Jakes and the Billy Grahams. There's a special place in our heart to want to be connected. And for some of us, we follow the crowd who's following the stars, but we're still following. And like I said, all of us seems to have this innate need to follow regardless to what we have achieved. It does not matter, there's still that passion that longs for a model to emulate. No ifs and buts about that. Now what I find about celebrities, although we have this passion to want to follow them, some celebrities are very cautious. They like fans that would buy their product and their brand, but some celebrities would simply say to you, I don't want you to follow me. Buy my tennis brand, Buy my t-shirt brand, but don't follow my lifestyle. But what is so interesting about the text and about Jesus, Jesus, the ultimate leader, extends an invitation to follow him to every single kind of individuals, every person imaginable, to the rich, to the poor, to religious people, to irreligious people, to spiritual people, to unspiritual people, to church people, to unchurch people. You name it, and Jesus extends this invitation. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel that kind of bears the name of the character that um, we are going to look at this morning, Jesus was on his way to take care of some other business, and he saw this young man sitting at the receipt of customs. And he simply said to Matthew in verse 9 of the, time, of the text, Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the booth, at the collector's booth, and he simply said, follow me. Follow me. And the Bible says, Matthew left all and followed. Now, what is so interesting here is that there was no long discussion. Jesus saw him, extended the invitation, and he was on the team. Now, you, you have to understand a little bit about Matthew. Well, about Jesus. Jesus is the rabbi, the son of God, the righteous one, the alpha and the omega, the high priest of all priests. And he stopped by Matthew, and when we kind of focus on Matthew's character, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, in our day, you know, that's a distinguished and honorable career, a customs officer, a border patrol officer. But in Jesus' day, and in this context, tax collectors, they looked at tax collectors as we look uh, drug dealers. That's how crazy this was. For you see, tax collectors were agents of the Roman government 
in towns and provinces like Galilee who really were responsible for collecting the taxes from the people that didn't want to pay. And they would collect these taxes from these people without proper representation. They collect these taxes in order to make their lives a little more palatable. And with the tax collectors, although they were agents of the Roman government, if the Roman government would say, well, you know, there's going to be 7.5% on all consumer items, the tax collectors would put on another 10%. And so depending on where you were, you were tax crazy. You think 75 or value added is tough. If you were in Galilee at the time of Matthew, I mean, it was just crazy. And so the people hated them with a passion. And so Jesus, passing by, is saying to this hated sinner, follow me. And what I noticed about the text that kind of stood out to me was that Jesus was ridiculed by the Pharisees for doing such a thing. Because they're saying, we know Matthew. Matthew is causing us much hardship, much grief, much suffering. And you're going to come here claim to be a reverend and so going to say to someone like him, follow you. And so they were taken aback by it. But what I want us to do this morning is to kind of look or look at the call to follow Jesus and several things that are attached to it. Firstly, Jesus did not require a prerequisite. You notice that? He didn't say, now listen, Matthew, go clean up yourself. Listen, Matthew, stop your bad ways. Listen, Matthew, change your company. He didn't say that. There were no prerequisites. Now, in our day and age, you know, in order for you to get into a religious group, they tell you all kinds of things. You can't wear that particular style dress. It's before you get in. If you are someone that, you know, you use some words that's not in the dictionary, that might disqualify you. And I, I know there were a time in my religious group that, you know, I grew up in, for ladies, you couldn't wear earrings or jewelry or any kind of jewelry. You couldn't get your hair done in a particular style. Ladies couldn't wear slacks. And you couldn't come to church without your hat on. No ifs and buts about it. For the guys, you had to have on your business suit with your necktie, no short sleeve, because they disqualified you from being a part of the club. You know, I remember I was fresh out of high school, and um, my sister, who was married to a police officer, lived in Nassau, so I flew to Nassau to spend a few weeks. And um, hanging out with my brother-in-law, who was an officer at the time, I had an afro. I want you to imagine that. Close your eyes and imagine. <laughs> I had a big afro. Back in our day, we called some special shoes clogs, bell bottom, plaid bell bottoms, and we went out for an, an evening. So he met a senior officer, and he said to the senior officer, I would like for my brother-in-law to be a part of the next recruiting class. Now, I didn't know that I was quite open to that, but, you know, my brother-in-law speaking on my behalf. And so the officer looked at me, and here's what he said. In order for him to enlist, enlist he got to cut that foolishness off his, hair, <laughs> off his head, talking about my afro. But he was, you know what he was literally saying? That a prerequisite to becoming a police officer was you had to have a military haircut. And I respect that 
But I wasn't quite ready for that, so I was disqualified. And so Jesus didn't put any prerequisites whatsoever in the way of would-be followers. Religion does that. Not Jesus. Jesus' call is come just as you are. It doesn't matter what you have been engaged in. It doesn't matter who you are associated with. No preconditions whatsoever. Don't believe me? Read the text. He simply said to Matthew, follow me. Follow me. Not only were there no required prerequisites, but being a sinner did not disqualify Matthew. It did not disqualify him from becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Not at all. I told you this story before of a friend of mine who even today he still hates church people and church simply because of his experience. You know, he was a weekend casual drug user and an abuser of alcohol. And so he told me one Saturday night, he drank all night and he took speed and everything else. And that Sunday morning, he was in deep depression, contemplating suicide, hanging out on the blocks. And he said it was church time in his community. And he saw a lady go into service that morning with a big Bible, you know, in the old days, we used to have them with the Last Supper picture on the cover. <laughs> Almost needed a crane to pull it along. <laughs> and so she was struggling with this Bible to church. And he said to her, he says he could hardly open his eyes. But he said to her, and he was desperate and very sincere. And he said to her, Mom, when you get to church, please pray for me. And the lady looked at him with scorn and said, boy, I don't pray for people like you all. He was devastated because he was really looking for a way out. And when we look at the life of Jesus, being a sinner does not disqualify you from becoming a follower. Sick people are invited. You're not quite physically healthy. You can still come along. Smart people are invited. No ifs and buts about that. Slow people are invited. There are no preconditions, and the invitation is open to any and everybody. And one of the things I don't like about religion, and sometimes some church folks, as we put all of these barriers up, two tourists were driving from Freeport to West End on a Sunday morning. They stopped at a traditional church that will remain nameless as they were driving through the community of Eight Mile Rock, dressed in vacation clothes, short pants, island shirt. They got to the door of this church, and um, they tried to walk in. The pastor, or the leaders, sat on the pulpit and saw what was happening at the door and dispatched an usher right away to the door and told them, no, 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 no. We can't allow them in dressed like that. And so these two people, on vacation, were turned away. And when I heard the story, I'm saying, suppose the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, had directed them there that morning to expose them to the truth and the power of the gospel. And because of religion, churchianity, we simply turned them away. You see how crazy this gets? And when we look at our Savior, he simply had an open door policy. Being a sinner did not disqualify you. And his call 
was centered around his own initiative. His call was motivated by his deep love and concern for people. You see, Jesus' primary concern is never whether what religion or denomination you attach to, but his concern is to establish a relationship with us, to get us on the path to where he would want us to go. And so we see the call of Jesus. It was not any required prerequisite. Being a sinner did, does not disqualify you. Because if that was the case, my listen, I would not have stand a chance in the world. But I want us also to look at the cost of following Jesus. Matthew had a very lucrative career, although he was scorned by his contemporaries. He made a very attractive living because there were very few boundaries. He made lots of money. And Jesus simply said to him, follow me. And the Bible sim says that Matthew followed, left everything that he was doing, and he followed Jesus. And here's the deal. Jesus went and dined with him. Jesus was some kind of leader. He went to the house of a man that was despised and rejected by his peers. And for some of us in religion, you know, we want to be careful who we hang out with or who we are seen with. A buddy of mine that I went to high school with, who strayed off the path after high school, got into the drug trade, lived in the States for many years, and he was home one day and he heard that his buddy, me, was now a preacher. And listen, we lived on the wild side in high school, and that's putting it mildly. And so he said, listen, he called, and he said, I want us to go to lunch on Wednesday. This was Monday. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm trying to establish a reputation in the community for being an influential church person. And here it is, this notorious drug person. Want to go to lunch with me? in the middle of the day when all the lights are on. <laughs> and this was Monday. I went into prayer Monday night. <laughs> and I told the Lord, give me an excuse to get off the island. And Tuesday, I was anticipating a call that, you know, from my buddy, that his schedule wasn't going to permit it. And I'm being very candid with you. I'm just telling you about what religion could do to you. And so Wednesday at the appointed time, my friend pulled up to the office. Are you ready? And you know, sometimes what you have to do, you have to pretend as though you have godly confidence. I said, yes, let's go. And we went out. And for the duration of the lunch, I was conscious. I wonder who's looking. What are they going to say? What am I going to hear tomorrow? This was a little before the punch, but I was wondering, you think we're going to make it there? But that is what religion will do to your psyche. But guess what? We had an awesome time together. And my friend today, is a deacon in a Baptist church in South Florida. <laughs> See, Jesus does not reject us regardless of how far we have fallen. Regardless of how wayward we have become, you could come home. And if you're listening to the call today, I don't know where you are, but Jesus is saying to you, I saw you last night, but come follow me. I know what is in your mind and your heart, but come and follow. And what is interesting, the cost that is attached to following Jesus 
is completely different sometimes about what we would want to imagine. Following Jesus, firstly, it requires surrender. And it's simply an admission that my way is not the right way. It requires surrender. Matthew, um, Luke 14, everyone who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. And let me put a precursor there. Jesus is not saying he wants your money. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. And sometimes we give this impression, as church folks, that all we want is to strip you down and take your wallet out. That was never the mandate of Jesus. When he talks about his possession, he's talking about those things that have you so attached that you are consumed to the point of not looking in any other direction. So following him requires surrender. Following him requires separation. The story we read from Luke chapter 14, where Jesus said to this group, I want to invite you to a special event. And one said, well, you know, I just purchased a piece of property. I can't come. The other one said, well, you know, I just bought some cattle. I cannot come. The other one said, well, you know, I've just married a new wife, so I can't come. And as I was thinking about that, I'm saying you just marry a new wife. If you don't come with Jesus, you can have a bad life. <laughs> marry a new wife, Jesus will give you a productive marriage if you're prepared to follow. So following requires separation, firstly from our petty concerns, secondly from our private obsession and addictions, and thirdly from our own personal ambition. That's the cost of following Jesus. And finally this morning, what is in it for us? What was in it for Matthew when he left everything that he had to follow Jesus? Well, firstly, Matthew got a fresh start. He had the capacity and the ability to start over. Only Jesus could do that for us. A fresh start. For you see, in life, you know what we do in our contemporary society? In order for you to qualify for a particular vocation, you need your resume. And your resume simply is a record of your past. And if your resume is not right, there's a 99% chance that you're not going to be considered. And in the world that we live in, if you did something 10 years ago, somebody in your community still remembers. Somebody would still hold it against you. Somebody would still remind you of who you are. I was preaching for many years, pastoring and so forth. And at the time, I was bivocational, working at a particular business. And this lady called one day, and she was a problem customer and I had to deal with her and she found out who I was and she simply said to me are you Isaac Outen's son I said yes ma'am the grandson of Thomas Outen yes but boy and you talking about you as preacher <laughs> I said yes ma'am well I want you to know if, if Tom Outen is your grandpa I know Outen's in heaven And I don't know what was the encounter with my grandfather, but she was holding that against me. And so people sometimes would lock in. Even if you didn't do it, or your father did it, or your grandfather, your grandma, they would still seek to hold that against you. But when we sign up to follow Jesus, he gives us a fresh fresh start. Regardless of what might have been the case, you can start all over again. And you know, that's why Christianity, or let me put it another way, being a Christ follower 
is so special to me because I came in with a clean slate regardless of my past. That is what is so awesome about this, my brothers and sisters. So you get a fresh start. You get forgiveness of all of your sins. Bible says he puts it in the sea of forgetfulness, and he remembers it against you no more. Now reflect on that for a moment. Think about your sin file. And Jesus is saying he is going to wipe everything off. And so you can have an intimate relationship with the God of the universe, even if you had a track record, record like Matthew. A fresh start, forgiveness of past sins, and future security. Now, what does that mean? That means you don't have to be overly concerned about your tomorrows because God has it under control. You don't have to be preoccupied. If you are a Christ follower that has been connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to be concerned.